لا ready بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد Last week we took dua as example of ibadah Today it's khawf and it's reverential fear Khawf is reverential fear and the proof is فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't fear them, but fear me if you are truly believers. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So after dua, he mentioned the second example as fear. In fear, the definition of it is to be frightened or to have anxiety or to be troubled as a result of expecting something that will bring about harm or injury or destruction. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the verse, and in many verses, forbade fear from everyone else, from the allies of the shaitan and everything else, and commanded it for him alone. And that's the first point. The next point is proof for ibadat comes through, uh, in the, the given unto other than Allah, shir, comes through two, two uh, avenues or two methods. Proof for what constitutes a ibadah and it becoming a shirk if it's given to other than Allah comes through two methods. And this is something I should have mentioned last week, but uh, I skipped out on it. The first method is when it's a ibadah, according to the definition we took last week, uh, when Allah commands something or orders it or orders the people who are doing it or commands the people who are doing it, it automatically becomes a ibadah. Now when it becomes a ibadah, given other than a given a portion or it to other than Allah becomes shirk. For example, فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ خَافُونِ Fear me. Allah commanded it. If it's Allah pleased to Allah or Allah loves it or Allah ordered it or He commanded the people who are doing it, it becomes a ibadah. Once established as a ibadah, there's automatic other proof that when it's a ibadah, given a portion of it, or uh, the entire ibadah to other than Allah becomes shirk. So long as it's ibadah, that's it. Automatically, after knowing it's a ibadah, you conclude that given the ibadah or a portion to it, to other than Allah is shirk. That's one avenue. The second avenue of proof is when these Ibadat have a special specific proof showing in one way or another that whoever gives that particular ibadah to other than Allah has committed shirk. This same verse used here in فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ happens to have two avenues, the two methods of proof in it, in that same verse. The first method is what we mentioned, خَافُونِ He ordered it. He ordered it that you fear me. That made it ibadah. Automatically we know from other proof that given ibadah to other than Allah makes it shirk. Now in the same proof, there's the proof in the, for the second avenue as well. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ خَافُونِ Fear me if you're believers. 
Meaning, you're not believers if you don't fear me. So this is specific proof that if you don't give your fear to Allah, then you've committed shirk. In kuntum mu'min, meaning that's, you're not believer. So the first type of proof, if Allah merely ordered it, if He commanded it, or it's people, it entails by other proof that you give a portion to other than Allah, it becomes shirk. If it's proven as ibadah, given another portion, a portion of it, or all of it to other than Allah, makes it shirk. Then there's proof that, that specific proof to some ibadat, وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says, fear me if you believe. That's a specific proof. That's a second avenue. That's good to know as a debate tactic when debating, for example, especially in matters like this, the grave worshippers in the Mubtadi'ah, when you uh, hit them with proof from different angles and avenue to show what constitutes shirk and how it becomes shirk. So when the author gives his proof on the matter of ibadat, sometimes he uses the first method, the first avenue, sometimes he uses the second. Now, the specific proof the author chose is فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ For this matter right here, for fear. Fear them not, don't fear, fear them, but fear me if you're truly believers. He ordered to fear him, وَخَافُونِ in this order is a wajib, it's commanded, it's a wajib. Fear of Allah is wajib, why? Because a general order without any additional proof taking it from being wajib to a sunnah means it remains wajib. And this is something inshallah we'll elaborate on in usul. The general order in the Quran or in the hadith means it's a wajib. And it doesn't get deferred to be in a sunnah unless there's additional proof to show that. If I say do it, you must do it. Unless somewhere it's a wajib. If Allah and the Prophet ﷺ say it, it means it's a wajib. Unless there's additional proof to indicate it's deferred to be in a sunnah. For example, grow your beard. Once the command comes, grow your beard or order, grow your beard. It's a wajib. Had we had one single proof from the Prophet ﷺ where he merely seen someone shaved and didn't say nothing about it, that automatically would take it from being a wajib to a sunnah. Now here there's an order. Fear me. Allah says fear him. That's a wajib. Why? Because there's no additional proof to show that that is deferred from being a wajib to a sunnah. Also, additional way, uh, is Allah made it a, con a condition of Iman. وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِ If you're believers, you fear me. Meaning you're not a believer if you don't do it. Also to substantiate and confirm the order to fear him uh, is, is that Allah in the, in, the, in the early part of the verse said إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفَ أَوْلِيَاءُ He deterred from fearing the awliya of the shaytan, of jinn and ins, and then he ordered direct fear to him only. If you don't fear him, you're not mu'min. As a condition of your iman, you have to fear him. So you're not mu'min if you don't. In summary, the verse deters from fear of other than Allah and orders fear of only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a condition of your iman. And that's the verse he chose. Next point. Not every fear is ibadah. Some are, some is, and some which in which you, in, if it's the type that's ibadah that constitutes if giving it to other than Allah becomes shirk. But there's other types of, that are not ibadah. And this is very important to know, especially for talabat al to know this. Otherwise they go around declaring some people mushrikeen if they have fear. And then it's not that ibadah fear. Once Allah ordered khafun, fear me, khafuni, it made it ibadah. He ordered it, it means it's something he likes. That falls under the definition that Ibn Taymiyyah outlined for us that what constitutes of ibadah that we took ismun jami'un likul ma yuhibbullahu wa yarda. Now there's four types of fear that you need to know about. Once you know these, you'll know which is shirk and which is prohibited and which is permissible at times. The first one is al khawf al tabi'i al jibilli, natural fear. And I'm going to go them with one by one, inshallah. Natural fear is permissible. It's not ibadah and it's not a negator of your iman and it's most definitely not shirk. 
Examples are fear of a lion or a predatory animal in front of you or a car coming at you at a high speed or you're around the building and the building is about to collapse near you or you're in a house and there's fire or you're in a river and you fear drowning or you see a snake and you fear that it's going to bite you or some who have public speaking, uh, fear of public speaking. If, if the means are there, it's considered permissible natural fear. This is the type of fear Allah mentioned about Musa السلام, when he was in the city and he became afraid. He became afraid. Musa became afraid looking about in the city. He was a messenger even though Allah said He was scared. In other verses talking about Musa. He left the city afraid. He escaped from there afraid. Looking about in a state of fear. Allah describes him as being in a state of fear. This is Musa. Did he commit shirk? Ma'ad Allah that Musa would commit shirk. When he was, when, قَالَ رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا نَخَافُ أَنْ يَفْرُطَ عَلَيْنَا أَوْ يَطْغَى Oh Lord, verily we fear that he would hasten to punish us or he may transgress upon us. About Fir'aun, Musa said that about Fir'aun. In many verses, about Musa alayhi salam. La takhafu darakan wa la takhsha. La takhaf najawt. Qala la takhaf najawt. من القوم الظالمين ففررت منكم لما خفتكم إني أخاف أن يكذبون there's a lot of fear in the story of Musa عليه السلام this is the natural fear the story of Musa عليه السلام should teach dua that if they happen to fear it may not be a condition of being a coward it may be normal at times when taking on a big task like speaking the truth or doing the most noble of matters, it may be some fear penetrates in the heart, the natural fear. However, the courage becomes not to let that fear deprive one of proceeding forth or make him go cowardly backwards. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik told his uh, brother Maslama, who was called Layth al Wagha, Oh, uh, Abu Sa'id, his kunya was Abu Sa'id. Did you ever fear in battles? Maslama said, I've never been free of fear, but I always used the fear to my advantage in de developing a ploy. And never did I let the encompassing fear that I get deprive me of stable thinking or going on forward. Hisham replied back to that statement, That's the true courage. He didn't let... He didn't let uh, fear stop him. Courage doesn't mean you don't have fear. That's natural fear. It means you control and direct the fear to succeed in what you're doing. As time goes by, that fear, even that natural fear, will vanish and go away. Uh, those verses of fear that we were saying in the, were in the early messagehood days of Musa alayhi salam. After one trains himself, controlling that fear, redirecting that fear to his advantage, in the advantage of his mis mission, giving victory to his goal and mission, that fear begins to fade away and go, and never uh, have any traces of it. The story of Musa in the early phases had so much fear in it. But look towards the end, towards the end of the messagehood. After plenty of practice, and not, let, and not letting fear get in the way, this type of permissible fear vanished. When everyone feared Fir'aun, he was behind them. The army that no one's seen anything like its likes. The ocean in front of them. And between them two is Musa and his followers. You would expect to see after all those verses of fear that Musa at this most critical time, when he was now in front of an ocean, the ocean in front of him, in the huge army of Fir'aun behind him, that he would be shaken in terror. But plenty of training killed that natural fear itself. Everyone was afraid, they said, قَالَ أَصْحَابُ مُوسَىٰ إِنَّا لَمُدْرَكُونَ When the two hosts saw each other, the companions of Musa السلام, said, we're overtaken, we're going to be overtaken, for sure. قَالَ كَلَّا إِنَّ مَعْيَ رَبِّ سَيَهْدِينَ Now the stunning words of Musa. 
Musa said, no. Verily with me is my Lord. He will guide me and protect me. What do you learn here? You learn here from this that natural fear is permissible. It's not shirk. When natural fear touches one in matters that you're following the guidance in, you use that fear and you redirect it to your advantage. You don't stop and with train and over time, it will vanish and go away that fear. Now the second type of fear, that's the first type of fear. The second type of fear, the first one is natural fear. The second one is al-khawf al-muharram, the prohibited type of fear. Al-khawf al-muharram. And this is also considered by uh, some scholars as shirk al-asghar, small shirk. This type of fear stops one from doing ordains or committing prohibitions. Fear that stops you from doing an ordain or refraining from doing, uh, 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 from, re from refrain from doing a wajib or getting you to do a muharram. And this is what is short of shirk. He fears that he'll make salah on time, for example, because uh, people will mock him in public places. He fears to grow a beard because he fears the employer will fire him. Uh, he fears to grow a beard because uh, he doesn't want to get scrutinized or delayed at airports. Uh, he, didn't, he was in a setting where people were listening to music. He didn't want to tell them that music is haram because he didn't want to be a, a singled out, criticized or outcast. He let his clothes go below the ankle because he didn't want to look differently or he didn't want people to point fingers at him or mock him. He didn't speak the truth and stand up for his brothers and sisters who desperately need him because he didn't want to be labeled as a radical or extremist. This is the type of fear that's in the verse. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ فَزَادَهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَقَالُوا حَسْبُدَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ The believers were told, this was after the battle, uh, that the, the Muslims fought. Verily the pagans have gathered against you a great army, so fear them. They gathered another army to fight you again. The hypocrites always come at you. Don't speak about prisoner rights. Don't forbid the evil. Uh, the, the West and their governments will tap your phone. When it was told to the Sahaba something of that similar nature, فخشوهم زادهم فزادهم إيمان It increased them in faith. And they said, Allah is sufficient for us and we put our trust in Allah. وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ The following verse tells, those who scare you, they're the devils. It's only the shaitan that suggests to you to fear his awliya, the awliya of shaitan. Some considered this category of fear as haram because it gets you to leave some ordains or it gets you to do some prohibitions for fear of other than Allah. Some ulama considered it small shirk. Because of the hadith in Musad Ahmad, and it really possibly depends on the heart feeling in this. It's between haram and small shirk. Because of the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah tells a servant on the day of judgment, why didn't you deter from the evil? And he says, oh Allah, I feared people. Allah says, replies to him, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, you should have feared me. Inna Allah yaqulu lil abdi yawm al qiyamah. ما منعك إذا رأيت المنكر لا تغيره فيقول رب خشيت الناس فيقول الله إياي كنت أحق أن تخشى He feared the people and he said and he admitted to Allah feared people Allah said you should have feared me Now under this second category under this second category the, the, the fear that's prohibited we have other additional categories and this is a matter that must be noted. And it's the conditions where one could possibly say the words of kufr, the exemptions where one could do the, say the possible uh, words of kufr, billah, or do a haram, or to not do a ordain. The first one is if the injury or harm 
or threat that you're going to get is unbearable. If it's ikrah, this is called ikrah. This is a someone whipped or lashed to the point that they can no longer take it. There's details on the level of what constitutes ikrah. But as Ibn Taymiyyah said, it depends on the one being tortured. Why? Because some people can endure extreme torture. Some cannot. Some are softies. Some ulama said prison is ikrah. Others said no. Each circumstance is different. And it must be studied and analyzed independently. It depends really on the individual. Uh, Al-Khazan said it must be extreme pain and torture uh, that one cannot bear or even death. Sometimes, for some people, one day in prison, and it could be an older sick man uh, who's very sick, that could constitute ikrah, unbearable harm. Whereas for a younger, healthy, strong man, a lifetime in prison wouldn't constitute ikrah. There's uh, other ev evidence and indicators that point what uh, ikrah is and what's not, and really it's got to be studied on an individual basis. One must keep in mind that the word of Tawheed and Allah's rights of haram and halal are mighty matters. And they're mighty matters that a true believer would hate to compromise unless it's the biggest of unbearable torture. And one with the strongest of iman would rather lose his life than compromise on that. There's no doubt being firm, even if it costs one, his death is better. But we're saying, what if someone decides to take the exemption? For example, when September 11 happened, some supposed shiyukh or dua or whatever they want to call themselves, they ran around issuing fatwas that a woman can just wear a hat for hijab. Some type of hat that they, they said is good and that's hijab. Why they said it's a krah? And that's foolishness, that's jokes. After September 11, you can possibly count on your fingers how many of our beloved sisters were harmed. Yet they began to make it an issue as if it was an issue of ikrah compromising something that's wajib. Those are the human devils. In that type of thinking. You need to keep ikrah in mind that ikrah is one threatening must be able to carry out what he claims. And you must not be able to defend yourself. And if you're ordered to say kufr or haram or leave a wajib and it's unbearable harm, then you can take it. If you can't defend yourself and he can carry out what he's saying he can, he's going to do to you. And number two, you have to believe that he will actually carry out that threat. It's not a possibility. Meaning if I don't do that haram or say that word of kufr, billah. He would definitely kill me. He would definitely, the whip is in his hand and he's going to whip me so much that I will not even be able to bear it. Mere threats don't constitute ikrah. As Ibn al-Jawzi narrated that Imam Ahmed uh, said in Zad al-Masir. That's the second one. Third is, what you're threatened with has to be eminent, it's going to happen now. If it's a matter of the future, wait. So not only are you sure it's going to happen, but it's going to happen right now, or very imminent, right in a few moments. So if they say, for example, shave your beard, or say words of kufr, uh, and the threat will, uh, will not be carried out. You wait until they're about to carry out that threat. And the, the final point is, if they give you a choice, like that of Shu'ayb alayhi salam. قَالَ الْمَالُ وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا مِنْ قَوْبِ لَنُخْرِجَ النَّكَ يَا شُعَيْبُ وَالَّذِينَ أَمَنُوا مَعَكَ مِنْ قَرْيَتِنَا أَوْ لَتَعُودُنَّ فِي مِلَّتِنَا قَالَ أَوَلَوْ كُنَّا كَارِهِنْ قَدْ افْتَرَيْنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا إِنْ عُدْنَا فِي مِلَّتِكُمْ بَعْدَ نَجَّانَ اللَّهُ مِنْهَا وَمَا you either leave the USA or do this haram. You know, you pack up and leave if they give you the choice. You don't see my property, my friends, my family. There's no ikrah if you have a choice. Just so you know, 
And I want you to know the level of harm one must be inflicted with or threatened with that he has to know will immediately happen before he says kufr or does a haram or leaves an obligation. So to know the level, you know when the whipping and lashing that they used to have back in the days is much worse than what's done today. In fact, uh, uh, the one lashing Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah said to him, لو ضربت تلك الصياط فيلا لهدته من جوفه. If the whips I hit you with, I went and hit an elephant with, they dropped the elephant dead. Imam Ahmad objected to the scholars who claimed the krah during his time. When they claimed torture, he said, that's not torture. When they were giving him the choice between saying the Quran is the creation of Allah, when it's in reality, the word of Allah. When Imam Ahmad objected to that, they, some of them gave in. Some of the ulama. And when they, he, he questioned them, they said, إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَ وَقَلْبُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ He said, Ammar, when he, that verse was revealed, he was being lashed. You guys were merely threatened. Meaning he didn't think it was sufficient to be threatened. You have to surely know that it's going to be carried out and carried out immediately on the spot. He didn't exempt them when they began to say the issue of Ammar radiallahu anhu and how he said what he said. Imam Ahmad, his best friend, one of his best friends, Yahya bin Ma'in. Yahya bin Ma'in gave in and said some words to avoid torture. Imam Ahmad objected to his friend. And he said about Yahya ibn Ma'in, he said one time, he tells me he was under a krah and he wasn't even lashed. So Imam Ahmad objected to his friend Yahya because he said it without being lashed or be, being threatened on the spot. So the scrutiny is very high to become ikrah and say uh, and use the exemption that we have. But keep in mind, and here's another matter where other people go wrong. You can't be a mu'tadi in ikrah. What does that mean? With Allah's rights, Allah is merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very merciful. He forgives. He gives you exemption. It's different with the rights of Muslims. So if it means under ikra, under torture or being killed, one, his heart is full of iman, he can say the words of kufr to avoid that punishment, the unbearable punishment. It's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes it an exemption to his rights. But not to the rights of Muslims. As in Ammar's case, he told Quraysh some words under duress and torture. That's Allah's rights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. They lash you so bad or they cut your, your flesh with knives, as we've seen on clips from Syria, and you say, Bashar is Allah, wal-iyadu billah, or whatever they want you to say. You can't take it no more. You say it. It's better to be patient and not say it. But if you do, you're exempted. But let's say they have someone in prison and they tell them to do fornication with another Muslim. I used to remember decades ago when I used to listen to Kishk rahimahullah and his old tapes and talk about prison conditions in Egypt back in the 60s. Uh, he said there were circumstances when they would tell a man to have a relationship, a prisoner with another prisoner. Even if they shred you piece by piece, you cannot do that. Why? وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزْرَ أُخْرَى No bearer of burdens shall bear the burden of another. And also, لَا ضَرَرَ وَلَا ضِرَارَ In Sunan Ibn Majah, لَا ضَرَرَ وَلَا ضِرَارَ There should be no harming and no reciprocating in harm. No harming and no reciprocating harm. What's common today Someone goes to prison, for example, all over the world. And they really want someone for another reason. Someone else, for example. Maybe someone who's speaking the truth on matters. The other person, they got no evidence that he did anything wrong in their supposed legal system. So they go to people around him, to surrounding Muslim community. 
they threaten them with prison. Or they harass them, keep visiting them. Or sometimes they take them to prison for some petty ticket or bogus claims. Then they threaten them with big sentences. Or sometimes they just merely imply threats. Then at the end they say, well if you testify against Sheikh so and so, or another individual, will reduce your sentence from 20 years to 5 years. Or we'll let you go home right now. Or we'll drop the immigration charges on you. And we'll let you stay in this country, we'll give you citizenship. I can name many worldwide who are like this. And many who are oppressed worldwide who are in prison because of this. They testify falsely to save themselves and put other Muslims in prison. You can't do that Islamically no matter how bad the torture is. Once it comes to harming a Muslim, the limits of Ikhlas stop. With Allah's rights, He gives you leverage. He forgives you. He doesn't hold you accountable. With Muslims, even if you're tortured or killed, even if you're tortured or killed, to rape a Muslim, to testify falsely, to say something, they give you the choice between that, the torture, and killing a Muslim. You be, go home, but you kill a Muslim, or you harm a Muslim, you can't. Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah said, Ajma' al-ulama'u ala anna man ukriha ala qatli ghayrihi annahu la yajuzu lahu al-iqdam ala qatli. Qurtubi rahimahullah said, it's Isma'u, one who is compelled to kill, another cannot kill him. There's no compelling in this, there's no ikrah in this. Not only killing, he said, there's a jama' you cannot be compelled, there's no ikrah to transgress on the honor by lashing or anything similar of that nature. Meaning they say, we whip you or you whip the Muslim. No, whip me. There's no choice in that. There's no choice. Kill him or you kill. No, kill me. There's no choice. وَيَصْبِرُ عَلَى الْبَلَاءِ الَّذِي نَزَلَ بِهِ Al-Qurtubi said he must be patient in this matter. There's no choice in that. وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَهُ أَنْ يَفْدِيَ نَفْسَهُ بِغَيْرِهِ اجمع. He cannot ransom himself for another. وَيَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الْعَافِيَةَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ نَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الْعَافِيَةَ نَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الْعَافِيَةَ At the end of his quote he said and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep you safe from those type of trials. It's a jama'ah. You don't have a choice in those matters. When it comes to the rights of a Muslim, it's not a choice of ikrah. Allah's rights, tolerable. Allah exempts you. He won't hold you accountable if it's ikrah. With Muslim rights, there's no choice. There's no ikrah. Now, the, the second level after that is mashaqqa. After ikrah, there's mashaqqa, which is difficult hardship that one can bear. It's a hardship, but one can bear. Like a little bit of lashing, a prison term he can handle. There's a difference between the first one I mentioned, ikra and mashaqqa. There's a difference between ikra and mashaqqa. Ikra is unbearable. The first one I mentioned is unbearable. Mashaqqa is bearable. It's a hardship, but it's bearable. One cannot fear this fear to leave and ordain or do a haram. The third one is, the third level, of harm or threat of harm is like curses or mocking. Uh, in this one also you cannot do a haram or it doesn't give you the exemption or leave out an ordain. And the fourth one is al-jubun, al-wahan wal-jubun. It's really being cowardly. It has no reality and uh, you can't leave an ordain or do a haram because for this one because really this one's a figment of imagination and really this is the one that really goes on most of the time in our communities. Let me give you an overall of what we took so far so you won't get lost because this branched out a little bit. The first thing we took so far is last week we took an example of ibadah which is dua. Today it's khawf. That, uh, so we took khawf. We took the definition of khawf. That's the first thing we took. Then we took the two avenues of how to show ibadah becomes shirk. Then we took specific proof that the author used for ibadah. Then we took the types of fear. 
Because not all fears are, are uh, shirk. The first one was natural fear. And we said that's permissible. Then we took the prohibited type of fear. And we took under it four categories of compulsion. That's what we took so far. In summary, uh, this is prohibited. Because it makes you leave an obligation or do a sin. The second type of fear. It's not secret fear. But it's an apparent one. There's people there who are going to make fun of someone. Uh, they're going to torture him. It's not secret or hidden fear. Uh, someone may curse him. So this is apparent fear and you cannot use that uh, to leave an ordain or uh, uh, do a haram. The third type of fear is the reverential fear. Ibadah fear or reverential fear. This is the fear that makes one do deeds and refrain from sins. This is the good fear. This is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what's considered ibadah. Therefore, giving it to other than Allah becomes shirk. To fear someone as you fear Allah becomes shirk. To fear someone to the point of worship like making dua to him, that's considered shirk akbar. Al-Fudayr ibn Iyad rahimahullah said, Man khaf Allah dallahu al-khawfu ala kulli khayr. Wa kullu qalbin laysa fihi khawfu Allah fahuwa qalbun kharab. Whoever fears Allah, his fear will direct him to all good. This is the statement of Fudayr ibn Iyad. And every heart that does not have fear of Allah in it is like a demolished house. It's like a wrecked house. They told Al Hassan al Basri, Abu Sa'id, the kunya of Al Hassan al Basri is Abu Sa'id. Abu Sa'id, there's those people who scare us so much about the hereafter that they tear and shred our hearts apart. They scare us. They terrorize our hearts about the, about, about, about the life after. Al Hassan al Basri said, For you to have friends who will make you fear so that you will be at security in the akhirah is better than to have friends who will make you secure in this world, feel secure in this world, and end up in terror in the akhirah. Now, is all fear of Allah praised? No. You got to explain it. We have to explain it. There's an explanation to it. A. There is the fear that's not praiseworthy. The not praiseworthy to Allah is the one that makes one despair and give up hope. It brings sorrow to the heart and distress and even makes one transgress in his sins because he despairs. The man who killed 99, they told him you're not going to be forgiven. He killed 100 and that's what happens when you despair, you have no hope in Allah. But overwhelming fear that makes you despair. You despair Allah's mercy and give up hope. That's the wrong type of fear. That type of fear will cause a person to continue in sin due to the fact that he totally gives up hope. That's the unpraiseworthy fear. Then you got the praiseworthy fear of Allah. That praiseworthy fear of Allah is when it prevents you from being disobedient to Allah and it causes you to fill the obligatory duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fear of Allah that deprives you of prohibition, makes you stop from doing prohibition, is praise. The fear that makes you do the ordain, that's a good fear. This is the fear that actually gives tranquility and happiness and peace to the heart. That's what keeps you steadfast on the deen. If you reach the goal with this fear, the heart settles and becomes at peace. When you truly fear Allah. And it becomes dominated by joy in the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you if you made mistake and will reward you if you did good. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in Madarij al-Salikin said Ibn Taymiyyah used to say the praiseworthy fear is the one that confines you from doing prohibition. It stops you from doing any prohibition. Some of the Salaf used to say one is not fearful of Allah unless he leaves sins. The next point is the levels of fear from Allah. In this category, there's levels of fear from Allah. 
fear of Allah is levels. The first one is fear of the planning of Allah. Allah says in this question mark, rhetorical question, do they feel secure against the plan of Allah? None feel secure from the plan of Allah except people who are losers. Being secure from the plan of Allah is a sign of a loser. The ultimate loser. How can you feel free from the plan of Allah when you know the hearts are between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He changes them as he wishes. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this hadith, he then followed it by the verse, by the dua, Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. He drastically changed the hearts. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua that his heart remained firm on his deen. How many rich become poor? How many poor become rich? He changes matters drastically. How many honored become dishonored in a moment's notice? How many dishonored become honored? How many wretched become righteous? How many righteous turned into being wretched? Your heart is like a blowing feather. It rapidly changes. So if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kept made dua that Allah keep his heart steadfast on the deen and his sins prior and future were forgiven, then that should be something on the tip of our tongue always. Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. You never, you never, you always fear the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're in front of a TV, look how your heart changes in a day, in just one day. You're in front of a TV, your heart is one way. If you're in front of, with bad friends, your heart is another way. If you're with good friends, your heart is in another way. If you're with ulama and talabat al ilm, your heart is in a much better way. Your heart changes so many times in one day. So you should always fear the plan of Allah. Sign of the truthfulness and righteousness is they fear the plan of Allah. That's the first type of fear of Allah. Then you fear the bad end. In this type of fear, fear in the bad end, shredded the hearts of the believers in our salaf. Uthman ibn Mad'un. Uthman ibn Mad'un radiyallahu anhu. The first man who was labeled a Salaf al Salih. First man to be buried in the Baqiyah. In the Baqiyah, he was the first one to be buried there. He prohibited alcohol on himself in Jahiliyyah before Islam. So imagine how good his Islam was. He was the brother of the Prophet by nursing. He got the honor of migrating, both migration, which is a lot of reward. The first one to Medina. And then before that, he was in Habasha, in Abyssinia. He was from the first believers who believed even before Dar al-Arqam ibn Abi al-Arqam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa entered in the house when he was dying. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa kissed him and it was said that tears fell from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on Uthman. And some consider this portion of the hadith hasan and some consider it weak. This portion about him, his tears uh, fallen on him. However, in Sahih Bukhari, when he died, Umm al-Ala said, May Allah have mercy on you. May Allah have mercy on you. Abu Sa'ib. Uthman's nickname was Abu Sa'ib. I testify that Allah has honored you. She's talking to Uthman ibn Mad'un. The Prophet ﷺ said, how do you know that? He told her, how do you know that? Umm al-Ala said, I don't know Prophet of Allah. I don't know by Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, look what he said. Death has come to him, and I wish all good for him by Allah. Look at that. By Allah, I, although I am the apostle of Allah, I don't know what will happen to me or to you. I don't know what will happen to me or to you. Umm al-Ala said, Wallahi, I will never attest to the righteousness of anybody after that statement by the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, By Allah, although I am an apostle, I don't know what will happen to me, nor to you. So how could we not fear the end? 
the end that we want it to be in good. When Sufyan al-Thawri was on his deathbed, a visitor walked in. He said, you cry in Sufyan because you fear your sins? He's asking Sufyan. So Sufyan took a little stick like a toothpick or something out and he said, I fear my sins less than this. What I fear is that I will be stripped of my iman before I die. He was on his deathbed. I fear I will not die a good death. That's Sufyan, the man who we spoke about. The alim, the muhaddith, the za'id, the imam, the abid. You remember we mentioned in this class about his ibadah. He then walked in to visit him, to visit Sufyan. Hamad ibn Salama, the imam of Zuhd. He said, good news Sufyan. You're going to meet the one you had so much hope in and he is the most generous. Look what Sufyan, he was giving him some hope. Sufyan said, Abu Salama, Abu Salama is the nickname of Hamad ibn Salama. He said, Abu Salama, do you think Allah will forgive a man like me? Ya Abu Salama, atara anna Allah yaghfiru li mithli. Sufyan al-Thawri says, do you think Allah will forgive a man like me? When Al-Muzani went to visit his Shaykh al-Shafi'i when he was on his deathbed, Al-Muzani is a student of al-Shafi'i. He said, how do you feel Shafi'i? He said, if I feel like I'm departing, but I don't know if my soul will go to heaven to congratulate it or whether it will go somewhere else so I can give it condolence. Mu'adh, the man the Prophet ﷺ says, Wallahi, I love you. The man who took Islam to Yemen on his deathbed at the age of 32 because of the plague, the ta'un that was spread, a youth committed to Allah. He used to keep asking, is it morning? They say, no. He said, is it morning? No. They said, why do you keep asking if it's morning? He said, I seek refuge in Allah from a night that I'll spend its day in hell. Mu'adh. Mu'adh said that. Oh Allah, he went on to say, oh Allah, you know I used to fear you and I have hope in you. Oh Allah, I didn't love life for its gardens and rivers, but the thirst in the day, meaning for his fasting, and for crowding around the ulama. Then he began to repeat, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, until his death. That's the fear of the, a, a snippet of how our salaf used to fear the bad. And then, Nas'alullah husn al khatima. The next type of fear is the fear of the punishment of Jahannam and not seeing Allah. Fear of not seeing Allah is terrorizing. Those who are doomed to hell, hell, a'adhan Allah wa yakum min dhalik, will face the biggest torment. But being deprived from the best pleasure of seeing Allah is even a bigger torment. Some ulama said the biggest punishment is to be deprived from the sight of Allah if you're, un, if you're not allowed to see Him. Wujuhun yawma idhin nadira. Then he says, وَرِضْوَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ And then he says, وَوُجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ بَاسِرَةٌ I give it a heaven bigger than the sky and the earth, yet it has no rooms, no room in it for you. And worse than that, is not being able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ultimate pleasure. The least punishment in hell is two tiny little stones under the feet of someone that will fry his brains. عَذَرَ اللَّهُ وَيَأَكُمْ مِنْ ذَلِكَ a place no one wants to be. Its food is hell, is fire. Its water is fire. Its clothing is fire. Zakum, Ghislain, Hamim, Qutti'at lahum thiyabum min nar. We conclude with that type of fear. Now that's the third type of uh, fear from Allah. Now, uh, uh, the third level. Now, the fourth fear. Secret supernatural fear, khawf is sir. Fear from other than Allah, that which only Allah could do. Like someone fearing someone, khawf is sir means fearing someone will harm you in a way only Allah can do. For example, a supposed saint in the grave harming someone alive. This is the type of fear that the grave worshippers have. And of course it's shirk akbar. It's like the people of Hud had, the fear that the people ha had in their idols. Uh, 
They told Hud, "Inna qulu illa taraka ba'du alihatina bisu." Qala inni ushidu Allah wa shadu anni bari'u min ma tushikun. They said the people who told him, "We fear, we think that our gods, which is their false deities, seized you with an evil madness. They put their curse on you." What did Hud respond to him? I call on Allah. Allah is my witness that I am free from that which you ascribe as partners in worship to Allah. He considered that shirk. He considered what they said as shirk. They said their Lord touched Hud with a madness. Meaning, you said something bad about our, lo our Lord, so they put a curse on you. They made you a crazy man. That's the fear they had from their false deities. When he responded back, he said, Mimma tushrikun. What you just said is shirk. That type of fear is shirk. Fear of a person in a grave or a wali far away can harm the way Allah can harm. That's called the secret fear. And this is a shirk al akbar. This category of shirk is shirk al akbar. That's major shirk, regardless of whether he fears one dead or alive. If they are dead, it's shirk to fear the dead, even if it's something that was under their control and power when they were alive. It's shirk because now they are dead. If I fear someone punching me, that's natural fear. But if I fear a dead person is going to punch me, he could have done that when he was alive. But now he's dead, it's shirk akbar. I can fear someone in front of me stabbing me. That's natural fear. We spoke about that in the first category. This fourth category, if I fear that fear in a person who's dead, it becomes shirk akbar. Fear someone can make me ill without means is shirk akbar. Fear of someone depriving me of having kids is shirk akbar. These are matters only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. Fear of inanimate objects like a blessed tree or like uh, metal that's around the Prophet's grave or something like that. Fear of that, that's shirk akbar. A particular story uh, comes to mind that a sheikh mentioned. Uh, he said they were visiting Egypt in da'wah on a da'wah trip one time. And in portions there, the ignorant take uh, Badawi as a saint. And they fear him the way they fear Allah. Many people do throughout the world, not just in Egypt. But he was visiting Egypt with a colleague. Some even fear him more than they fear Allah. In statements that they say. The sheikh said we were in the back seat of a cab, taxi cab. And a young boy came and asked my colleague for money, a beggar. The sheikh gave him a little bit of Egyptian money. The young boy got greedy or didn't think that was enough. So he said, I ask you by Bedawi to give me more. Note, he said, I ask you by Bedawi. Bedawi is the saint. He didn't say, I ask you by Allah to give me more. And it's known in some areas that they take Bedawi uh, similar to Allah, giving qualities to Allah. And if you're asked by Bedawi, it's known you have to answer. That's how you avoid the curse of the Bedawi on you. The Sheikh said, give me back the money I gave you. The Sheikh said, because you gave an oath by Bedawi, you don't get nothing. You need to learn a lesson never to give an oath or ask by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they drove away. The cab driver said, Yustur, 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 save us, save us. The Sheikh said, what are you talking about? He said, uh, he's asking, he's asking Bedawi to save them. Uh, he said, you cursed or disrespected Bedawi, look what's going to happen to us now. And the driver became afraid of Badawi because he deemed that the sheikh disrespected him when he took the money and wouldn't give the young boy. When they reached their destiny safely, the sheikh said, look, this is a true story. He said, look, we reached safely. Nothing happened, alhamdulillah. Instead of the cab driver realizing that's fake, what he was doing in that shirk, he said, al badawi has been patient with us. Shirk after shirk. Badawi is dead in his grave. He cannot harm or help. This is the khawf as-sir. 
This is the shirk akbar. This is was mentioned in the verse. وَكَيْفَ أَخَافُ مَا أَشْرَكْتُمْ وَلَا تَخَافُونَ أَنَّكُمْ أَشْرَكْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ عَلَيْكُمْ سُلْطَانًا فَأَيُّ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ يَحَقُّ بِالْأَمْنِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ How should I fear those whom you associate in worship to Allah? They can neither benefit nor harm. They can neither benefit nor harm. That was the statement of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's important to know these categories, these four categories of fear, the main ones that I mentioned, because some declare someone a mushrik if they have the natural fear. And you've seen that a lot. And this should clear up that matter. And as a very last point, uh, bear with me. Uh, what's the difference between khashya and khawf? Khashya and khawf bo both mean fear in Arabic. However, khashya is more specific or a higher level of fear because it combines between the fear of Allah and quotes it with the knowledge of Allah. Fear of Allah with the knowledge of Allah. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he talked about himself, he didn't say akhaf because he's the Prophet ﷺ. He has ma'rif of Allah, he has knowledge of Allah. He says, Ama wallahi inni l'akhshakum lillahi wa atqaakum lahu. He says, he's at a higher level, so he's used khashya. I have khashya of Allah. Look when Allah talks about ulama, because they know Allah. Innama yakhsha Allah min ibadi ulama. Khawf comes from an ignorant, whereas khashya comes from the knowledgeable in Allah and those who have ma'rifah in Allah and fear in Allah. Another difference is khashya comes because you honor. You see one you fear as mighty and supreme and you love him. Whereas khawf could come at times not because you honor, but you fear because you're a weakness. So that's a linguistic difference. The second one is a linguistic difference in the uh, khawf and khashya. Uh, I thought we would have time to finish raja, uh, but we will inshallah finish it next week. Jazakumullahu khaira wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa